Hello and welcome to the readings for the 26th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel is St. Matthew, chapter 21. Jesus said to the chief priests and elders of the people, What is your opinion? A man had two sons. He went and said to the first, My boy, you go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not go. But afterwards thought better of it and went. And the man went and said the same thing to the second son, who answered, Certainly, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the father's will? The first, they said. And Jesus said to them, I tell you solemnly, tax collectors and prostitutes are making their way into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you a pattern of true righteousness, but you did not believe him. And yet the tax collectors and prostitutes did. Even seeing that, you refused to think better of it and believe in him. This is a very interesting reading and it takes us down a number of roads. Of course, to begin with, one can see that it's a contrast between the people of Israel and those Jewish people and then Gentile people who follow Jesus and become the church, the kingdom of heaven. It's not enough to be, to be religious and to inherit all the, the paraphernalia of spirituality and the law, but not do it. And in the Gospels, Jesus constantly returns to this theme and the story of the prodigal son is one of the best examples of it. But it seems to me that for us, we can take it as an invitation to explore notions of the self, because after all, we're, we are both of those people. We are, we are both the people who say to the Lord, yes, of course I will, and then, and then we don't do it. But we're also the people who say to the Lord, no, I won't. And then, and then do do it. And the difference between these two aspects of our self in Christian terms is repentance. But we're surrounded by two very different models of what it is to be a human being, one in the gospel and one in our society. And one of the difficulties that we face now as Christians is that we're immersed by the pressures of the culture around us. It's very interesting during even my lifetime how the secular culture has changed its models of anthropology, its, its patterns of what it means to be a, a human being. And certainly in the early part of, of the last century, Freud was very popular. And it was Freud who sowed this dreadful seed that repression, otherwise known as self-discipline, could be harmful. And catharsis was absolutely important. You had to let things out for them to be real. This has turned out to be largely not true. And of course was made much worse by Freud emphasising that our happiness, our well-being, our sanity was closely allied with uh, our sexual freedom. And it turns out that in fact that freedom became anarchy and quite the opposite happened. Our happiness, our sanity, our well-being was damaged by sexual anarchy. It wasn't catharsis at all. But although Freud gave us the terms of ego, superego, and id, the, the ego being the, the exercise of the will, the umpire between uh, a, a conscience, the internalised voices of our parents, the, the superego, and the id, this sexualized energy which was always rampant and difficult to control, um, that model was soon superseded by, by Carl Gustav Jung. We never left behind some of the wretched um, canards that Freud slipped into popular understanding. But Jung's idea came to be all about the worship of the self. All the language we have about people fulfilling their potential is language that Carl Gustav Jung gathered together. All the language about floating spirituality and the integration of opposites is a pattern that Jung provided in his map for individuation that nobody ever achieved and no one can really measure, but has caught on and has captured our imagination very powerfully. In Jung's idea, the self is the, is the replacement for God. The self is what we're trying to, to bring to fruition and that we need to, to serve. The self is served by the integration of good and evil, by the integration of polar opposites. 
nobody questions this in our society, even though <clears throat> Jung's ideas are, are agnostic and un, unscientific and unproven and on the whole don't work very well. And the problem is that Christians have given way to Freud and Jung so easily. And we too have begun to talk about the development and fulfilment of the self. <clears throat> but actually in Christian language we have a different model. Particularly we can distinguish between the self and the soul. But you don't hear Christian preachers and teachers talking about the soul very much. And yet we could very helpfully see the distinction between the soul and the self as being the difference between heaven and hell. God wants our soul to be reborn. It's our soul that he renews and refreshes. It's our soul that's in his image. Our self <clears throat> is, that, is that part of our understanding where we exercise our wills to protect ourselves. Christianity is full of teaching about what happens when you enter into the, on the Christian way and become born again, born from above. St Paul is really wonderful. St Paul says that, that once you've begun to fall in love with Jesus, behold, the old is gone and the new has come. And the old involves self-criticism, this dreadful condemnation that we hear in our heads all the time, a product both of our distorted psyches and also the father of lies who whispers to us, one amplifying the other. Behold, says St Paul, when you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. This idea of being a new creation is very powerful. Charles Williams, uh, an English theologian, summed it up beautifully when he said one of the differences is that you come to know evil as good. And this is the difference between being in Christ and out of Christ. Being out of Christ, we are surrounded by things that go wrong all the time. And they often can't be put right. There is an accumulation of, of evil in this world that grinds people down. History is the long story of evil done to other people, unremittingly, of the abuse of power. But Charles Williams quite rightly says that to be a Christian is to know evil as good. In other words, to know that God has his hand on everything and will bring good out of evil. Mother Julian of Norwich was very good at this. She talked about all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. And what she meant was that God has promised to make everything better. He's promised to heal everything. And the Christian therefore is someone who looks at things going wrong at one level and knows that like a divine undertow, God will bring things right in the end. Actually, he'll do more than that. He will use evil. He will use disease and despair. He'll use breakdowns and he'll bring good out of them. I don't think there's any doubt that although I've hated the suffering in my life and haven't handled it at all well, much of that suffering has allowed me to develop a compassion for others where otherwise I might have had a judgmentalism times of mental turmoil and distress when I felt I was close to going mad or nervous breakdowns have allowed me to develop a sympathy for people whose mental, own mental health hangs by a thread sometimes. The great antidote to saying try harder or pull yourself together, those dreadful phrases that wound the already wounded even worse. So even at one level of empathy and understanding and compassion, our own difficulties can be fuel for love. But at a much more profound and mysterious level, God will take evil and bring good out of it. Mother Julian says to the Lord in one of her visions, Did you know what you were doing when you took the risk of giving us free will and letting evil free into the world? There's been such pain, such suffering, such disaster. Everything we might say from the Black Death in her time to Auschwitz in our own. Are you sure it was worth it? And the Lord says to Mother Julian, you will discover on the very last day, I will do an act. I will show you. There will be this great act of inversion. The darker and the worse something was, the more it will be the cause of glory and redemption. 
Julian, like us, has to take this on trust. But we already have an instinct for it. We certainly have a pattern for it. We look at Jesus on the cross and we see there the greatest disaster you could ever have, the most wonderful man, the kindest, the most, in human terms, the kindest, the most loving, the most generous, the most salvific. He who went around healing others from, from, from physical and psychological and spiritual dis-ease, suddenly crushed by jealous evil and killed. And yet that killing, that torture, that rejection, that dereliction became the source of all the goodness that lifts us into heaven, that gives us new life. That greatest <coughs> disaster imaginable becomes used by God, who pays the price for it himself. It's not just a picture, a metaphor, a myth. It's an experience God goes into. I myself could never have believed in God properly without the Christian story, without the Christian facts. I would have needed a God who validated the risk he took in giving free will and allowing evil free range by paying the price himself, by coming and standing alongside us and saying, I'm not asking you to go through anything I haven't been through myself. That was one of the things that most softened me up to receive Jesus as my Lord and my Saviour, to believe in him, to love him forever, because it was a kind of precondition for me that God should take the rap in some kind of way, that he should go through everything he had asked me to go through, and so very much worse. And so looking at Jesus on the cross, I can believe. Looking at Jesus on the cross, like Charles Williams says, I begin to know evil as good. I see the most disastrous thing, and I say, there, that's the centre of God's plan and will to bring good out of evil. And that's why Christians have crucifixes everywhere. And the rest of the world says, what are you doing? How can you possibly have this gory image of an executed man in the most desperate pain and humiliation? And Christians say, because we understand it's a code. It is a coded secret that allows us to see evil as ultimately going to become good in God's hands. Ultimately, on the last day, we will say, Worthy are you, O Lamb of God, for all praise and honour. For you have redeemed humanity, you have redeemed creation. Nothing will be wasted, nothing will be lost, except those who choose to be wasted and lost. As C.S. Lewis says so rightly, it always comes down in the end to either praying the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done, or my will be done. And if we say my will be done, then we condemn ourselves to hell, to isolation, to a breach in the loving fabric of the universe, to expulsion. But all the time, right until the end, the Lord looking at us as that second group in the Gospel of people who say, I won't go, I won't behave, I won't do as you ask, I will not conform, constantly invites us to change our mind, to soften our will, to be loved into obedience. And at the heart of it all is repentance. And that I think is partly why John the Baptist was the central motif hidden behind the Gospel story. Jesus was saying, why didn't you believe John? Why didn't you? as the ordinary people did, listen to him saying the key to being reconciled to God is repentance. And that for us is the difference between discovering the love of God and being lost forever. It's the key because it's repentance that allows us to turn and to move from the will to power of the self to the loving rebirthing and refreshment of the soul. It's saying, Lord, have mercy, which moves us from the self to the soul, which moves us from hell to heaven. And as we look at ourselves, it's not our potentiality that matters. It's not the integration of, of opposites, this entirely false idea that 
disables us from recognising evil and rejecting it that Jung so subtly placed at the heart of his insidious project of individuation. Instead, it is this, this difference between good and evil, between the will to power and obedience, between being helped and saved and being determined that only we ourselves can find the way in our own strength. We need to recover as Christians the priority of the soul. We need to remember the importance of confession as one of the disciplines that keeps us close to forgiveness and the practice of forgiveness and repentance. And we need to remember at all times that one of the central parts of, of the love of God is this, is this new pattern of, of living. Charles Williams again said there were a number of different different uh, patterns. You could have you could have the new self on the old way, that is you become a Christian but you don't change your ways, you don't change your morals or your ethics or your patterns of behaviour. Or you could have the old self on the old way, that's the way to hell, that's where most people are until they meet Jesus. Um, or you could have well, the old self can't manage the new way. It doesn't want it, it doesn't know it. What you really need is the new self on the new way. He who is in Christ, following Christ, and clinging to him. And Paul talked of this immersion in Christ. So Christ becomes us, we become him, not in an egotistical conflation of the two but are being immersed into him so that we remain who we are but we take on his his characteristics we take on his we are given his virtues we are clothed in love and forgiveness and renewal whereas left to ourselves we would decay so as we follow Jesus let us allow our minds to be converted as well as our souls and develop this Christian anthropology where we interpret life through a lens that is able to distinguish between those things that please the self but separate us from God and those things that renew and refresh and heal the soul or the medicine of the Christian journey. And then we will truly know everything that happens to us as good and we'll be able to say with St Paul, all things work together for good for those who know the Lord. Let us know the Lord. Let us know all that comes to us as evil, as the potential for good that God will make it. And let us find ourselves always giving thanks and always praising him. For it is the knowing of evil as good is the antidote to all complaining and allows us to be people of praise and people of joy. To him be the glory forever and ever unto the ages of ages. Amen.